Welcome to Conversations with the Authors. Welcome back to Conversations with the Authors. I'm your host, Daniel. I'm Daryl. I'm Sandra. And the last name is Troop, of course. Thank you to Alexander Nakarada, who I'm sure will go down in legendary history, perhaps mythology. Today, we're going to talk about mythology. Let's say, Daryl, Sandy, Mom, Dad, let's say that an alien race decides to come to Earth 3,000 years from now. Mm -hmm. Or humanity has somehow evolved to better than they are 3,000 years from now. And they look back at some of our fanciful stories, our fiction and science fiction stories. Will these science fiction stories today, will today's stories become tomorrow's mythology? And when I say mythology, ladies and gentlemen, dear readers, I'm talking not just about Greek mythology. I'm talking about this sub genre of folklore and which is in fact what mythology is how nicholas became santa claus novel that you've written which just received a nomination for an award correct mm -hmm. correct yeah uh has all the elements you would find in uh uh mythology but you also find it um fits into other genres of writing so what are your thoughts my, my thoughts is that uh the story is is a folklore, mm -hmm. and folklore, it's among traditional stories, right. but it's new, of course, and in legend, mm -hmm. because it is based on right. a historical figure. Mm -hmm. However, we, we've taken it and we've, we've fictionalized you, you put it a greatly, twist on it and, you know, yeah. and put a lot of fantasy in it, and we put a great twist on it. So I think it would be legend and folklore. I think so. And I, I think it, it fits into, and again, folklore uh, by, uh, you know, definition of mythos is mythology. And I think that uh, it, it does in fact fit in this mythos because Santa Claus is the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, Saint Nat Nicholas Claus, you know, uh, and you've got s such great uh, stories and plots and characters and, you know, it fits into, you know, there are three, you know, main subsets in mythology. There's creation, you know, cre creationism. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is where, you know, how myths explain what, how things have, were created. You have the the hero myths, which explain the quests of heroes. You well, have, you know, and I think that's what myths were right. supposed to do. They were to explain the world and teach moral lessons. And you have a lot of that happens. Divine cult, you know. Uh, in your story, too. Divine culture. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You have explanations for nature, these nature myths, I would argue, in your story, which explains how the world of Nicholas works, why things work the way they do with your oddlings, with your aurora borealis, with how magic works, mm -hmm. uh, and arguably how it affects things in our world in terms of... Uh, why they work the way they do. So uh, I think Nicholas, I think Nicholas fits. I think, I think Nicholas so. fits. But you say it's, it's both. And, uh, you know. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's legend because it is, it is based very simply loosely. on very extremely loosely. Uh, but uh, we, we really go into a lot of uh, the fantastical uh, things in the story. And, you know, so I, I think uh, we, we've got, uh, other stories like and Santa Claus is kind of like Paul Bunyan, I think. So, uh, yes, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe like even King Arthur or even Robin Hood, uh, whom a lot of people suppose that these individuals actually live. They may, yeah. may or may not have. We know Nicholas, the real Nicholas, did. We know that, and with the magic and all, and and and, and the the fairies and the. the 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 magical creatures in it too that I think that would fit into the folklore genre too as well. I think you're right. You know, and uh, you, you know, you have your characters who are confronted with a lot of you know moral um, dilemma, teachings huh? and dilemmas. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. Which mm -hmm. again fits into the genre. So you know, I, 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 the story you know it kind of begs the question a little bit when you, for instance, I mean. When you see the sun rising, is it the celestial body moving, you know, you know, around with the earth, or is this, you know, a fiery chariot being pulled by a sun god, you know? 
uh, you know. And that would be some of the mythos that, and not only in in, in Greek mythology, but in American uh, Indigenous Americans right. as well. And there, are, you know what? Every culture, every has culture. mythos. Absolutely, every one. Okay. You know, Zoe whether, this morning asked me if the sun was a lollipop that was being held up to make a dragon stop crying. Yeah, so he's... Uh, well, uh, she's three. Three, yeah. So, she was well, watching Cocoa Melons. So they have uh, a really, really wild imaginations. So, But they have to explain. People invent these things to explain things and how the world works. So, I mean, I mean when, I was, when I was a kid, I, I thought that the signals from the... From the television set came through the plug in the wall, you know. Yeah, so right. I, you know, how are these little people getting yeah, inside so this moving box? As a, four, as a four year old, I thought, well, this is how it must work, right? You know, and mm-hmm. I, I believe that. But we seem, as human beings, to have the need to know why something is, how it is, and how it got that way, and will it always be well, that know, way? When I was a kid, there was a kid show on uh, that uh, took place in a train station, and there was a jukebox. There was a radio that would play. And every once in a while, the camera would cut to the inside of this radio, and there are these puppets with instruments playing the music for the radio. So in my childish mind, I thought, oh, okay, that's how that Mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and so when people have no other – if if people don't have any other explanations for things – you know, they will construct explanations. Yes. There was some philosopher I heard once that said that if God wasn't real, that someone would invent him. Yes, you know? yes. <clears throat> um, and uh, so did was this in your mind when writing Nicholas that, you know, it was going to fit into this, this sub, the genre, subgenre, or was this something that it just sort of happened to be this way? It started out with just happening to be this way. Mm-hmm. It start. It actually started out with you and your brothers and sister asking questions of of of, of things like how come the the leaves have different patterns so when they're so that was an inspiration. That was inspiration. For yeah, you. it was, mm-hmm. and it was. Now, how do I explain the science to a 11-month-old or a 2-year-old mm-hmm. or a 3-year-old and so I said, "Well, you know, that's odd." You know, Oddlings. You know, I I and you can inspire by a lot of things and I do. And when you when you think of it, it um you you don't design which way the story is going to yeah. go. The story designs itself, right. you know, as you write it. So, I had no idea that if it was going to be folklorish or it was legendary ish i i just wanted to write a good story so you follow your outline and then all of a sudden the story the takes story you, right? takes over and it starts writing itself i was yeah i was going to ask you when you start out with a story it, it seems that you have this sort of path before you and you're trying to decide what path your characters are going to take what path the story is going to take Mm-hmm. And I think, I wonder if perhaps that's how some authors sort of get trapped, is that they're trying to manipulate the story, whereas... It, yeah, and not let right. the story write itself. The story. And as a matter of fact, I think that's a good analogy. To, that there's a path. Some people are stuck to that path. They won't allow themselves to get off that path. Right. My story, when I write, it's either going to take a long cut mm-hmm. or it's going to take a short cut. Or it might it might leap over something, so, and, and, and it, it gets to where it's going to go by itself because the logic of the story and what's happening in the story dicks t- dictates the way it's going to go. And if, it, it's funny that that you say it was a path because I would get to this point and then I would draw a a, a little diagram or a picture mm-hmm. that's well. If it goes over here, it's going to do this, and if it goes over here, it's going to do this, and if it's going to go over here. It'll do this. And then if I couldn't make up my mind, I'd ask you kids, well, which picture do you like? And, and uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and I, I think just to add on what she's saying, and it will do that. But you also find yourself doing a lot of cutting, too. Yes. And don't, please don't be afraid to cut. We you know, because you, you, you can fall chapters. in love with a, with a character. You can fall in love with a situation. You like the words you put down on the paper. 
and you and you don't want to get rid of them. But then sometimes it, it makes the story cumbersome. It makes it confusing or it doesn't take you where it should be going. So cut. It's too long. Do you ever, it does do you ever cut a character in a story because you feel like you've fallen in love with this character? Like you're too invested and you're like, I'm going to have to kill this character because it's pulling me off track well, off path do you ever no i haven't had no, that no, experience no, I don't have, no, I, you know that you're sort of rooting for this character so hard you lose focus of the other characters in the story well then then you have to tone him down mm-hmm. or bring him back to a certain spot uh but I, I don't take vengeance on him because of that you know uh if you just if he's going to serve the story and if he's going to maybe he's might make you cry if i if i kill him so I, you I, look back at I, your outline and it. see what your purpose is. Yeah, see what your purpose is. You know where your story's taking you. You mm-hmm. actually ask the story. Where is this? I mean, go? look. Think think of the movie. Remember the movie Old Yeller? I yes. mean, people talk about that all the time. I saw it when I was a little kid when it was a brand new movie, mm-hmm. and the dog died. You know, and everybody went out crying. Uh, the dog had to die. You know, if he didn't die, the movie wouldn't work. You know, it's interesting, <laughs> though, because you say you you don't want to punish a character because of that. And and, and that's admirable. And, but interestingly enough, there's a an animator, a cartoon, a, a comic book, whatever you want, his genre, his job might be. Uh, a very famous name is Akira Toriyama. Akira Toriyama is famous for the Dragon Ball series. There are two main characters in the story that we tend to follow. It's Yara Goku-san, mm-hmm. uh, our son Goku, and we have Vegeta. And Vegeta is the prince of all Saiyans, so he's this hubris about him. But apparently, uh, rumor has it that Akira Toriyama never liked the Vegeta character. So we didn't. We never really saw a lot of character growth, right. or you know, happiness, or you know, in terms of like attaining his goals. They were always far slower than his counterpart Goku, and it turns out it's because he just didn't care for the character. Yep. So I wonder sometimes if other authors tend to come to that sort of same problem as they just end up not liking this character so much. A lot of authors have that problem. You know, I, I it makes you make it me is. think of a, a movie. I think it was Deep Blue. Yes. yes. Okay, mm-hmm. and it was underwater, yes. and uh, at Samuel L. Jackson, oh, it, was shark. it was with the shark, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. And they got to a point in there where they were fighting and they were fussing, and then uh, Samuel L. Jackson standing on a edge of an indoor pool said, "We are not going to fight anymore," and he got. Eaten, eaten yeah. by a shark. Yeah. And then when I heard later what was supposed to happen in that scene, he wasn't supposed to get killed. Uh-huh. But the story led to that, right. and it was just at the right point, and he had to go, and they made they killed him off. But he said, he Samuel L. said himself that at that point, he wasn't supposed, his character wasn't supposed to die. Right. But they decided that this was a good place for him to go. So um, <laughs> before I ask my next this sort of question. When you uh, are writing, how often do you find yourself sort of uh, letting the characters take their own path? And was this something that you've always been able to do? Was this something you had to learn to develop? You know what? It, it's it's and if you did learn to develop, how would you advise our our readers who want to be writers to do the same? You know, when I'm writing, there's a part in my brain that's dedicated to that character at that time. Mm-hmm. And he's thinking in a certain pattern, and I'm writing it down. Mm-hmm. And so this story starts to carry itself. And there, situations have logical conclusions. Right. There are things that people say and people do that lead to other things. Right. Yes. And when you get inspired, and your character thusly gets inspired, right. sometimes he's going to lead him on a path that he's going to lead him to 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 become a hero or lead him to. Go underground and be dead. Right. You know. Right. So, so or just and, and be, or other things. Or just to be put in. So it, it 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 right. truly truly writes itself because the next line you write you say well this has to make sense and this person just did this they said this they're in this situation it is logical that this should happen. So with <laughs> all of these machinations that are going on and these techniques that are being used. Uh, to d- divine these stories, what are the chances that these aliens who come to our planet or these humans who have evolved and are looking back in our history uh, 
sort of have a Galaxy Quest moment, you know, and uh, are looking at these historical records of, you know, uh, Star Trek or Star Wars or, uh, you know, uh, I think they might turn the rye, and they're going to say, "Oh, this is this is what the society was uh, like." This or how Nicholas became senator. Or your manga games. Right. Your video these games. These people have powers, yes. uh, or they, you know, so they'd have to figure it out. And and w- they might figure it out. They might not. And, and what is it? Do you think <laughs> that is that links folklore and historical stories uh, like? Uh, um, those in classic Greek myth and stories we're writing now, like how Nicholas became Santa Claus, what is it do you think that sort of perpetuates them into the future? What the, what what keeps well, them going? I the, think the need for contentment. And I, I think common themes. There are common human themes that are ubiquitous among humans, and things that there's love, there's hate, there's envy. Uh, there's 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 greed, there's forgiveness. There are all of these qualities of humans that were in that'll be in the future humans that were in the, the caveman. Mm-hmm. They were all they were all there. Right. And you know? will continue to so be I mean, it, humans. It's, it's, it's like before we could read in eighteen hundreds, before we could read hieroglyphics, mm-hmm. you know, nobody knew what those stories on the on the walls of those uh uh Egyptian temples right. were, and then came along a young man. I think his name was Champollion, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he was able to uh, to to figure out uh, hieroglyphics, mm-hmm. and they were able to read the stories. They were no longer, and some of them became amazing stories. Now we know about the the uh, the, the pharaohs and mm-hmm. uh, 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 of Egypt, their wars, mm-hmm. their celebrations, and their gods, and all of that, just because he was able to break that code, right. and he did that with the Rosetta Stone. Right. Okay, when they found it. And so it, it just opened up a whole new world. And when we find that those stories are not unlike the stories we have today. We've got leaders and we've got we've got kings, we've got presidents right. who want a lot of what right. you know the, and the, just the, like, the pharaohs right. wanted. And just for, like in yeah. Nicholas mm-hmm. and how Nicholas became Santa Claus, there are kings and there are wizards. And there are all these creatures, and there are these people who want a lot of a lot of stuff to want, right. right? And there are people who want to stop them from getting that, and people who are trying to get in the way of getting that, and and everything is looking for balance, right? And and so there's there's this um, relatability, as you said, this ubiquitous ubiquitous uh, relatability uh, to the stories, mm-hmm. but also too. Uh, I think just as with classic mythology, whether it's Greek, Roman, Japanese, Native American, what have you, there's also this fancifulness to it, this this fiction bit part of it, this escapism, I think, mm-hmm. that Nicholas also offers. There's this beautiful world that you, mm-hmm. you open the book and just escape into. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't help it. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's, I wanted something where you can lose yourself. I wanted a place to go where I could t- get out of my problems for 10, 15 minutes or, or maybe an hour or maybe all night long. I think. And, and, and yeah. go somewhere where I've never been and wanted to go to. And, and that's what myth and folklore and, and legend offer us. They offer us escape into, into times and to places that we might not ever be able to to get to, yes. you know, and mm-hmm. it opens up our imagination and it makes us wonder about things. Sometimes it makes the creativity that goes into it, uh, I think, produces a creativity in the reader, too, because then they see the world differently. Yes. Mm-hmm. It, it allows you to, to take different parts of yourself and and do things that you want to do but are afraid to try Mm. and do them and do them way beyond your expectations well and if you if you want to do something that's way beyond your expectation and you want to be amazed and enthralled and you want to go places you thought you'd never go experience things that you'd never thought you'd experience you can visit our website at troopbooks.com where it takes you to the author page and you can grab a copy of How Nicholas Became Santa Claus in paper 
or on hardcover. You can visit our social media at troopbooks.com, at Facebook Troopbooks, at Instagram Troopbooks, TikTok Troopbooks, and even Twitter Troopbooks. That's T R O U P E. And I hope next time, as you read the book, I'll hear from you and their authors. We'll have a conversation here on Conversations with the Authors. <laughs>